Meal kit delivery services are pretty normal nowadays, but of course, people have taken this way too far. I mean, honestly, we've got people ordering things like bottled water or apparently 30 to 40 pounds of chocolate. But that's not the weirdest thing about these services. The crazy thing is how popular they are despite how obviously terrible they are for everyone involved. Food delivery is not a particularly novel idea. It's been around for centuries. In the 1300s, butchers sent meat to the wealthy customers in their homes, and the literal milkman became a thing back in the 1700s. But it wasn't until the 1950s, with the invention of the television, that food delivery started becoming necessary for restaurants to survive. With the sudden draw of this magic box at home, people just weren't as interested in going out to eat. So to stay afloat, restaurants started catering to people in their homes. The very first food delivery service online that we could find was called Worldwide Waiter. It was launched in 1995, followed by Grubhub in 2004. And it's in the 2010s though, when things really started to get competitive with DoorDash, Uber Eats, and the rest of the gang, as you know, entering the scene. Now, even before lockdowns, Uber Eats in particular witnessed massive success. This isn't particularly surprising considering how internet-centric our culture has become. We're used to having quick and easy access to whatever we want, and Uber Eats et al are just the natural evolution of that trend. And of course, as you can likely guess, COVID did nothing but wonders for this business model. During that first year of lockdowns, 380,000 restaurants signed up for Uber Eats. 45 million people started using the service and the company's annual revenue jumped from $1.9 billion in 2019 to $4.8 billion in 2020. That's more than double. But weirdly enough, Despite these massive sales, Uber Eats is actually losing money. In order to stay competitive, they deliver food at a loss and are expected to continue losing money until at least 2024. Now, while this sounds objectively terrible, this is actually a relatively common situation amongst these tech startups. The idea here is that if they operate at a loss long enough, they'll secure enough customers to starve out all the other companies and become the king of delivery services. Then at that point, they can rack up all the prices and no one will have anything to say about it. But in the meantime, they have to do what they can to stay afloat while retaining customers. Now I know you've probably all shed many a tear here for the Silicon Valley startup CEOs that are probably struggling through these hard times, but sadly this affects more than just the wealthy elite. For restaurants, Uber Eats has become the very literal definition of a necessary evil. Because of the takeover of meal delivery, they can't survive without the business they bring in. However, they pay a commission fee of up to 30% on every order. This doesn't include the one-time fee just to get on the app in the first place and the fact that they probably have to do this with two or three other apps as well. Most of these restaurants are just just barely staying afloat with the lockdown as it is. Getting almost a third of the price dinged off of a bulk of their orders can be a death blow for many independent restaurants. One of my favorite local Indian restaurants confided to me that through Uber Eats, they have like three to four meals that barely break even. Another component is all of that extra packaging, which they didn't have to pay for previously. Not only is this an additional cost to them, but it's a huge problem for the planet. I actually made a whole video about this on my other channel, and this was the garbage that just I created from eating Uber Eats for two weeks exclusively. Now, when you just think of the problems of Uber Eats, you probably imagine the drivers. The struggles of so-called gig workers is well established. One estimate is that drivers can expect to make eight to $12 an hour after expenses like gas and maintenance. That's not even minimum wage in many states. Some drivers have even taken legal action against the company for exploitation and unfair dismissals. 
Basically, these are just contract workers, which means no health care, no insurance, no pension, no nothing. Just to make sure that your curry arrives as cheaply as possible. But hey, listen, I got my butter masala. I'm here on the couch. I didn't even have to leave the house. Life's pretty good. I'm living like a king. But even the people who apparently this is all for are getting screwed as well. This late night double mukbang of stupidity ends with the bill in front of the consumer. There is literal memes about how expensive Uber Eats meals can be, and sadly, they're not even that far from the truth. For example, where I live, if I wanna get pad thai from a local chain, I can get it for 10.45 from the restaurant itself, or 12.45 on Uber Eats. And before you say, hey, come on, you gotta pay for convenience, this is before they charge me $2.99 for delivery and then an additional 10% for service fees. To buy the exact same meal through Uber Eats, I end up paying 60% more for one friggin' meal. And that's if I'm just being totally stingy and I don't even tip the driver. If you're not tipping your driver, people, you, you should just tip your driver. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't even know why. Do I have to say this? Look, I know why Uber Eats is popular. It's a futuristic vision to demand food and have it delivered to our doors. But this is like the Walmart dystopian nightmare version that I don't think anyone really asked for here. As technology improves, we as a society are increasingly used to fast, easy access to pretty much everything. But we have to start thinking about what we're willing to sacrifice for this illusion of convenience. In our previous video, we talked about how meal kits are kind of a reaction to the cultural breakdown between what we eat and where it comes from. Now, if meal kit services are like the band-aid on a gaping wound, Uber Eats is salt. When I was a kid, I used to like hate going to like a local farmer's market with my mom and dad because like they would just talk to people for ages and all we would get at the end was just like kale and a bunch of vegetables. But now I'm an old man myself and I understand the appeal and not just because it's got an Instagram-y kind a country chic vibe and artisanal crafts and whatnot. No, it's because of the ability that you have to connect face to face with the people who grow your food. That kind of connection is really rare nowadays. And being able to buy local food that is fresh, you know, or maybe you, you get to try something that you've never tried before. I mean, that's a very unique experience that many of us don't have. A big part of the reason why we have health issues, food waste problems, and agricultural challenges all across the world is because we are so removed from the food that we eat. And thankfully, the solution to this problem is something that we have been doing as a species since the beginning of time, and that's cooking. I talked about this in my Uber Eats challenge video where I ate exclusively Uber Eats for two weeks to see what would happen. And for me, there's really something meaningful about a home-cooked meal shared with other people. That care and effort that you put into making the food makes the meal that much more satisfying. Not only that, but the process itself can be a memorable bonding moment with everyone that is gathered in the kitchen working towards that common goal. And restaurants have their own charm too. They're a chance to get out of the house, to go to a different setting and experience something new. But Uber Eats gets rid of both of those things in favor of convenience. And this isn't just my personal opinion. There's a growing body of research on mindful eating, basically paying attention to your food while you're eating it. When we do things like slow down before a meal or give thanks for that meal, and we put in the effort to notice all the tastes and textures, we tend to digest our food better and enjoy our food more and eat healthier. And then when we do this as a family or with friends, we get the added benefit of strengthening our relationships and connections with our culture and heritage. As an example, children who frequently eat together with their families, learn communication skills and build self-esteem and tend to have better psychosocial outcomes than children who don't. And I think we should be taking this a step further. I think kids should cook all the meals, you know? Get those little twerps working for a change, you know? They'll appreciate their food way more. And finally, they'll be paying back parents for all the hard labor they went through just getting them to this point in life.
I say this as a person who doesn't have kids, but I'm just saying, when I have a couple little ones, I ain't gonna be cooking my own food. <laughs> <laughs> but with meal delivery, you don't have that personal relationship with your food and you don't also have the unique experience of eating out. You kind of sacrifice both to get convenience. And I would argue that convenience is rarely as enjoyable as we sort of think it's going to be when we're lazy on the couch and just don't want to move and press order. Now, of course, there is definitely a place for meal delivery options, but in general, it's a good idea to avoid meal delivery services as much as possible. Instead, you may have to use this thing, I know, God forbid, it's called a telephone, and you have to call your local restaurant and then go and pick it up yourself. Your wallet and the restaurant will thank you. But let me know, am I out to lunch here, you know? Have I bitten off more than I can chew? I would love to hear what you think of this whole weird situation down in the comments below. And of course, if you are digging the content that we're making here, you can subscribe. And then you'll get another dose of this every Wednesday. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs>